Today I'm going to talk about something that's old but kind of come, come back around to being in fashion again, and that is static sites, um, and specifically static site generators. So obviously that's me, Brian Rinaldi, at Remote Synth if you want to follow me. I, th I had this theme I came up with because um, I was thinking around like, oh, it's static and something old coming back, something, you know, coming back new again, and poltergeist kind of somehow came to me. <laughs> and, and coincidentally, they're making a new poltergeist, so it's like, oh, you know. So anyway, um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm from Boston. That's a picture of Fenway. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, funny enough, I, I made that picture about a week ago. It, it was, it was, back then, it was supposed to be like a complete exaggeration. It was like, yeah, that's totally ridiculous. Now, the only ridiculous part is the tauntaun. Everything else is totally real. <laughs> We've had like, um, just not to bore you guys with details, but in under uh, like about a three and a half week period, we've had over 90 inches of snow in a city that if any of you have ever been to Boston has already really narrow streets to begin with. It's a freaking nightmare. Anyway, um, I also work for Telerik. They're ones who sent me out here. So um, most of you, how many of you have heard of Telerik? Oh. All right, a handful. Um, uh, those of you who haven't may have heard of Kendo UI. Anybody heard of Kendo UI? And so we make Kendo UI. Um, we also make the Telerik platform for doing mobile development. We have a new, uh, it's going to be open source tool called NativeScript for doing native apps in JavaScript and stuff like that. So check some of that stuff out. And if you want to ask me about any of that stuff, you know, you can grab me afterward. So, um, you know, in college I was actually a history major. So, and so I always kind of like to go back of like, how did we actually get to this point? So I, before we get to like what the different static site engines are, I want to talk about like, well, where we came from. So, you know, back when I started doing web development, you know, we were do, I was using, well, this is Dreamweaver <laughs> 1 or 2. Um, you know, using Dreamweaver to make, I mean, static sites was probably most of the web at that point. Um, I did a little cold fusion at the time, which was kind of early dynamic sites. But, you know, how many of you use Dreamweaver back in, all right, yeah. So you might feel the same way I do about, like, thinking back to that. <laughs> a little scary, right? Um, so the thing was that static sites, while they, they were, they were e relatively easy to build. I mean, you needed a developer to build them, but once you got to a larger site and you had more content, it was really hard to maintain. And so, you know, it just wasn't a really useful tool. So we just decided, well, you know what? We're going to hook up everything to content management system. Like even a rinky-dink little site, we're going to hook up an enterprise content management system. And, you know, and the tools kind of got a little out of hand, right? I mean, you know, you start using these enterprise content management systems to, to to maintain relatively simple content sites. Um, and it just wasn't a really um, good solution, good long-term solution. And a lot of, you know, it, it was over-architecting a lot of sites. So how's the way the static site engines differ from those things in the past is it kind of takes this middle ground whereby it's not, I'm not having to hand code static sites or use Dreamweaver Design View or whatever. Uh, how many of you use Dreamweaver Design View? How many of you will admit you use Dreamweaver Design View? All right, there's nothing wrong with it. I used, I've used, I used to work for Adobe, so I, you know, I'm all, I did it. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was a Flash developer. Will you hold that up against me? <laughs> so, um, well, one, so it kind of sits in this middle ground. First of all, like, you, you know, you can manage content, but there's no databases. Everything is files, file-based, right? And um, so you don't have, like, to have, you don't have to have this whole back end when you, when you publish the site. Um, another thing is, uh, well, skip that. They're, uh, they're easy to customize. There's templating support. So, so I don't know if, if you were ever doing static sites back in the day when, when like, Dreamweaver had these Dreamweaver templates, and they were supposed to be the solution for helping, like, to make, it easy for you to develop a site and then pass it on to like your, you know, the people who had to create the content, except it was a freaking nightmare. It was really hard to create the templates. They were really hard to customize and just never worked out. Um, so, 
you know, these are really relatively easy to create the templates and stuff, and it, um, as we'll go through, you'll see. So that's one difference. They all, for the most part, are extensible. Most of them support plugins of some sort. So like if it doesn't do something that I want it to do, I can create a plugin um, using whatever language the tool is built in. Now they're built in, there's tons of these tools and they're built in different languages, but most of them support some kind of extensibility. Um, now the ease of authoring is relative term. For developers, this is really easy. Um, most of you probably have used Markdown at some point, and for the most part, they, they support Markdown. Um, and they also, obviously, you can just do straight HTML if you want to do straight HTML. Um, some of them support some other templating, uh, sorry, authoring languages and stuff. But now I say that ease of authoring, if you know those different two ways of authoring, right? It's not like I'm going to go into like a word processor and create this stuff, um, create the content that way. And they have a simple build and deployment process because, I mean, in the end, we're just generating static sites. So, I mean, I could just generate the static sites and FTP it up. It's just static files. There's no, there's no, you know, database to maintain. There's no, um, it's not a complex process. I mean, there's different ways to deploy it. We'll cover that very, very briefly. But, um, but for the most part, it's just like, you know, create, create the content, hit the build, push up the files. That's it. Now, one of the key differences, though, is that, is that back when we were creating static sites back, in, you know, when, when I was starting out my career, like, you basically couldn't add any sort of dynamic content, right? You were stuck with whatever was on the page. So one of the things that has made this a viable solution nowadays, actually, is that you can add dynamic content. So like if you're creating your blog, you can have comment. You need comments, right? You want to have comments. So I can have comments, but those are run through a service like through Discus. Um, I need forms with, or some kind of way to get feedback, and I can use WooFoo or I can use Google Forms. Um, I want to add a dynamic calendar. I can use the Google Calendar. Or even I want to just basically be able to just pull in dynamic data, and I can use like a, something like Parse or, or well, Telerik has their Telerik backend services, which is like Parse, but from Telerik. Um, so the, those are just some of the options. But basically, the difference being I'm not just stuck with the static pages I put up there. There are services that allow me to have the specific pieces that I need dynamic. I can make those dynamic using those services without, obviously, without having to regenerate the site every time, right? Um, that, and I have these slides posted on, on GitHub, and I'll give you the URL later. Um, but um, that article by a friend of mine, Raymond Camden, goes over a, a lot of how to, like, how to use some of these tools to basically to build your static site, but add in these dynamic elements using those tools. And I'm not going to cover that in depth. I'm just going to cover the different tools um, themselves. So one important note is that these tools are pretty much across the board, all built for developers. This is not like um, something you're going to hand off to a typical person who just creates content. Is they're going to know what the heck to do. Even if I, I mean, even if I say I built it, I have a developer build it, they hand it off. These people are, are really not going to know what to do with it. And the tools are, are all run through the command line. Um, they're all using ways of creating content that people who just create content are typically not used to like Markdown or writing HTML. They want to write in some kind of tooling. Um, and and any, any kind of, like even the data and stuff we'll talk about how it uses like JSON or YAML. And these are things that your, your content creators are not going to be able to use. Personally, I think there's a really big missed opportunity here for something that isn't quite, say, WordPress. but like the tools are pretty easy, but there's no there's no way to like you'd almost think somebody could just put a front end on this and allow me to hand it off to say somebody to create content, and the tool you know they hit build and the tool knows what to do behind the scenes and push the files up and so on. I mean it's really not that complicated, but it doesn't exist right now. So right now it's really just for developers, and if you're going to have people creating content, they're pretty much going to have to pass it through a developer at some point or another. So if I'm, uh, we're going to take a look at some of these. And obviously, I need some criteria for how we're going to evaluate them. 
Um, documentation is a big thing. Obviously, um, these are a lot of these are, are, are well, they're pretty much all open source projects. So, you know, one of the weaknesses sometimes of open source projects is they're not well documented. If you want to get started in this, how well documented it is is obvious is really really important. Um, I'm going to look at how easy it is to get started and get set up. Like, what's the process for getting it installed? What's the process for um, kind of setting up my first site and so on? Language support. By that I mean not like multilingual support. What I mean is like all of them support different. Uh, like you can obviously use straight HTML, you can do JavaScript and CSS, but some of them have things like support for SAS or LESS or CoffeeScript or TypeScript and so on. Um, so that'll be one of the criteria we use. Um, so I'm going to look at templating. One thing that I'm, I'm mentioning, though, as I say, using defaults is because all of them pretty much have, uh, like based on the documentation or the beginner template that they start with, they kind of lead you into a, a default templating language, which is kind of like what their, their primary templating language, but most of them support others. But just to kind of be fair, I'm going to use the one that they push you into rather than like try and evaluate it based on all the templating languages they may or may not support. Um, so creating content, like how easy is it to create new content and publish that out? Um, dynamic custom data. So basically, one of the key things here is that, is that what you want to be able to do is say not everything is going to be an article or a blog post or something like that. I may have, like I may want to maintain a some kind of data that, that is, is published out dynamically. Like for instance, my blog, I have a list of articles I've written and conferences that I've spoken at and stuff like that. I want to be able to maintain that list, but I don't want to have to like maintain the page separately. I want to be able to just dynamically generate that based on some data, right? Extensibility, so it does, how easy is it to make plugins and does, or does it support plugins at all? And I'm gonna, what I'm calling project health assessment, um, which is just basically like, is this project regularly being updated? Is somebody really maintaining it? And so on. So based on um, this site, staticgenerators.net, there are 384 existing static site engines. So um, it is now se almost seven o'clock. Hopefully you guys have made no plans till sometime next week. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> so let's get started. <laughs> I've got a sample project. So what I did was I, to, in order to evaluate these fairly, I created a simple sample project, which is basically the same site I built repeatedly using the different engines. Um, it's based on. A, you know, I came up with the Poltergeist theme after I created the sample. So um, it's based on Adventure Time, which is a really fun cartoon. Anybody, anybody love Adventure Time? Yeah, all right. Not that many of you. Come on. The rest of you got to get, you know, this cartoon is hilarious. So um, anyway, so Adventure Time is a really fun show on Cartoon Network. And I based, I created a simple site that has basically characters and episodes. I'll show you it in a little bit running. So here's the different engines we'll review. Jekyll, which is pretty much the most popular one out there. Um, it was created by the, I can't remember his name, the guy who created, one of the guys who created GitHub. Um, and it basically runs GitHub pages and stuff. So um, mo how many of you have heard of Jekyll? Most of you. That would be the one pretty much everybody's heard of. How many of you use Jekyll? OK, quite a few. All right, another one is called Middleman. Um, it's, a, it's basically another option. It's relatively popular. It's not quite as well known as, as Jekyll, but it is pretty well known. And the last one will be Harp. Those are the three. We're not doing all 384, sorry. <laughs> Those are the three that I chose. And I basically picked three that, that were among the most popular. Obviously, Jekyll being the most well known, and, and Middleman and Harp are among two of the more popular options out there. Um, Later, I'll li I link to an article which I wrote that also looks at one called Roots. Um, I chose not to do Roots for this presentation for various reasons, but you can, if you're curious about Roots, you can look at that article. So let's start with Jekyll, getting started. So Jekyll is Ruby-based, um, so you, you know, that you would install it with, uh, you know, gem install Jekyll. You will need the sudo, otherwise 
you know, on, on your Mac. It will not install properly. Officially, there's no Windows support, so this could be an issue for those of you who are Windows-based. Like, in fact, that's why I lugged this giant MacBook Pro over here, because I didn't feel like going through the trouble of setting it up on my um, Surface Pro, uh, which I usually use for presenting. But anyway, um, so you know, if that's an issue for you, it, it could be a big one. To create a new project is pretty easy. You just Jekyll new and then you put your product project name. It's going to create a folder, fill it with some basic files and stuff. And to start a, a server, you know, you just change directory into that project folder and Jekyll serve. And it will actually watch your changes and so on. So like if you're editing the files while you're work, you know, while it's in the browser, it'll it'll refresh kind of like what you may be used to. Um, so templating is, uses the Liquid Template Engine. Um, that's a link to the Liquid Template Engine project wiki. Um, and content is marked down with what's, what they call front matter in YAML. Um, anybody, do anybody not know what YAML is? Anybody not use YAML? OK, everybody knows what YAML is. So it, it's basically just like JSON, but with less curly braces. Um, <laughs> I don't know. How else do you describe it? <laughs> so um, it does support other template engines and other uh, ways of writing content, but those are all through plugins. And we are going to we'll switch out here to my code editor. We're going to take a look. I want to take a look at my Jekyll project here. Oh, let's get this bigger. Come on. Lord. There we go. All right. So just to give you a sense, this is my Jekyll site here. And this is on, on I'll link to, to the um, GitHub project later, but um, that way you can get all the code. So this is my site settings, um, which it, it puts in a config file called, uh, in YAML. And, um, and you, there's some basic settings that you kind of have to have, but I can have other settings that define things that I want to I want to set. So in this example project for instance, I have global settings that I wanted to be able to customize as well as per project settings, uh, per article settings I want to be able to customize so that I could test out like how difficult is it to add fields to a, a post? How difficult is it to add fields that are global that I want to use throughout the site? Right? And so in this case, like for instance, title and email and stuff like that, um, those are pretty basic. Um, but this banner is something I wanted to set. This description is another one that I wanted to set. And these are global to the site because I'm putting them in the um, config YML. Obviously, this one I haven't set because this isn't a real site, but that would be typical. Um, and then the markdown, it, it tells you, like, it uses GitHub flavored markdown by default because obviously this is what runs GitHub pages and stuff. So, um, and this excerpt separator is another property. So one of the things I want to be able to do was on each post, I want to be able to say, um, set, put something that indicates where the summary would end. So I don't have to write a separate summary. It's like, okay, part of the post would, where the summary ends here and the rest of the post goes here. So when I show, I'll show you the site and you'll, it'll make a little more sense. Um, actually, let's go ahead and run the site. Uh, hold on. Sorry. My I can't even see what I'm switching to here for some reason. All right, which one's Jekyll? So this way you can get an idea of what the site looks like. So I'm going to click. Uh, this one, don't worry. I will, oh, the code I bumped up, but this is I'm not really going to do much in the command line here. So this is just I'm, all I'm doing is saying Jekyll serve, so I run it. That's all. All right. Why this is so small? All right, that's the, so by default, Jekyll runs it on, the, on uh, port 4000. So this is my sample site. Uh, the things to understand about the sample site, the, the um, and I'm not a designer, so I just stole this design from an open source design site. So these characters are all run by, by data that I'm pulling in. So this is not like, these are, these are not static per se in terms of like hard coded into the page. I actually have a data file, which I'll show you, that runs all the characters and the character descriptions, as well as their images. Um, this recent episodes, these are the blog posts. 
So this would be like essentially, you know, what your content, your Markdown content, you go, like, this was all created in Markdown. Um, the, these are the other posts here. This is, if you saw that YAML front matter for the, for the global settings, like that defines this banner image in this description here, which you saw, if you saw it in the description in that YAML file. So I'm running, th those are global set, like a global variable, you can say, for the whole page. So that, that's basically it. Nothing particularly complicated. There's a handful of posts for, for the site, and each of these sites generates the same thing. So what I wanted to be able to compare was, say, like the global variables, local. Each post has its own. Um, so here's the summary. You see how I want to be able to define so that it fit nicely in my design where the summary ends. Um, based on the post here. And then each of these posts also has some, some specific custom data that I set. So that runs the banner image that's up there, as well as this subtitle here. Just so I could see how easy it was to set a, you know, specific custom defined variables on a post, right? So that's what that looks like. So we'll go back to the code here. Uh, cancel. I didn't even think I made changes. Um, so that, as you can see, that description comes from this config YAML as well as the banner and so on. If we look at um, the design, I wanted to show you a little bit of what, what uh, Liquid looks like so you can get a sense of how easy it is to customize the look and feel. So you, you have these layout files. These underscores indicate one, um, things it's not going to generate. So these are like kind of, um, like, it's, gonna, it's not going to generate a corresponding layouts folder with HTML in it. it those are, these are just the templates. So like some files, like this index.html, it'll generate an index.html on the generated files, the static pages that come out on the other end. But these underscore folders, it won't generate a corresponding underscore, like a corresponding folder on the final generated site, if that makes sense. So this is what Liquid looks like. Um, I can do things like I can include partials, which is basically like I want to be able to separate my layout into multiple files um, without having to like put everything in one big file. So I just include, in this case, head.html, which is going to look here. Um, I have it in, in includes here. And I've got head.html, which is just a basic, you know, this is the head of the page. But that way I can easily separate out my layouts into multiple files without having to, you know, dump everything in one big file and repeat lots of code. I can put repeatable sections in, in separate files here. Um, I cannot, this is where, like, I'm, I'm spitting out the content that's generated. Obviously, I've got the footer. One thing interesting to look at would be, you know, in uh, header, not head, I can do, like, if, you know, statements, and I can do loops and things like that that you're used to within the layout files. So like this one, I'm saying like only on the home page am I showing that main banner. On the other pages, I'm going to hide that banner and so on. Um, Index.html defines like where the, the index, the home page. So this is the layout. You can see like I'm looping through data here. Um, this, is, this is looping through the YAML custom data for the characters. This is creating that list of characters with the images. So I'm looping through that. Um, you can see that accessing custom data is pretty easy. I just, I have a site.data.characters, and that's, so everything in custom data is under site.data, and I kind of define where that is, and my data is in this underscore data folder. So here's my characters YAML, and this has like, you know, the name, the image, and the description that runs that whole section there. And then, um, you know, I also loop through the posts. One nice thing which will, will kind of play more of a part as we look at other ones that I like is within um, Liquid. This has got some helpful things like, for instance, here I can say for po you know, post in site post limit two, because that's the first part where I only want to show the top, the most recent two episodes. So I'm saying like stop at two. Sounds like a simple thing, but you'd be surprised it's not in a lot of other templating languages. Don't have support for things like that, and you have to kind of find workarounds for things. They also, like, it also has a built-in, like, date formatting and stuff like that, which also is surprisingly not in a lot of other templating. So, so Liquid is pretty, pretty flexible. And as you can see, I mean, if you know HTML, it's pretty easy to, to write this stuff. Um, 
it, it doesn't take a lot of, it, there's not a lot of extra knowledge in learning how to create liquid templates. It's, it's a pretty simple syntax. Um, and the documentation for that is pretty good. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Did we switch? All right, there we go. So that's what um, the, the front matter looks like. That's what liquid templating engine looks like. We also looked at the, the, the YAML front. Um, one, well, actually, we didn't look at this. Let's just quickly go back, sorry. I'm going to look at the posts. So here's all my posts. I put them in the post folder. One thing you have to understand about Jekyll, for those of you who use it, know it, is it has to be named in a particular fashion. So like I have to actually name it with this date format beforehand and then the, and then the um, title kind of written out that, that way. And that, that's how I define what the URL is going to be. Um, and then I can actually define what layout the particular post uses on a per post basis. Some of these, so a lot of this, this is the YAML front matter and a lot of this is basic like required stuff. But then I can add whatever I want. So like I added this short description and I add the banner. Those are kind of custom front matter variables that I use. And when I display the posts, so yeah, let's see. As you can see, like here, I just use page.short description, and that's accessing that YAML front matter variable that I created on, on my own, right? So you could create whatever you want in there and use that in your layout. So other than that, the rest is just basic markdown. All right. So um, for the data files, I showed you YAML. That's kind of like the default, but it also supports JSON and even supports CSV for data files if you want to keep them that way. So as an overall overview, like, like give it some ratings as far as these are obviously my opinion of the pr particular project. Other people have different opinions. These are my opinions. I think it's pretty easy to get started. It's not perfect. Um, but it's pretty easy. I, I dock it. And for those of you who don't know, that's Casper the ghost. And Casper's a good ghost. And so these are more Caspers equals more good. Okay. <laughs> Just in case you need explanation. So I dock it for lack of default, like, built-in Windows support. Because, you know, I know a lot of people here may not care, but a lot of people out there actually do use Windows. You'd be surprised. Um, Template and content, I think Liquid is pretty flexible. It's got lots of helpers. It's really easy to use. Um, and the content, I mean, it supports, it supports the GitHub flavored markdown by default that you want, but it actually has, you can do other formats as well. Custom data is super easy. It's not only easy to add custom data, but it's easy to access it. There's no like convoluted route to figure out where the data is coming from or how to access it. Documentation is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's really good um, comparatively. Uh, extensibility. I mean, there are tons of plugins. There's a whole page dedicated to plugins. There's even sites dedicated to plugins for this. There's a lot out there. It's, it's, so there's a big community creating plugins. And it's not that hard if you want to create plugins of your own. Obviously, um, you do need to know Ruby, but that's a, you know, a whole other thing. You know. um, and language support. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a lot, so most of the stuff is written in HTML and JavaScript. You have Liquid and you, so you can have plugins for things like SAS and other, th other, other things, but out of the box it actually doesn't support a lot of, of like, you know, CoffeeScript, SAS, less, and so on. So there's not a lot of that stuff. Overall though, I give it five Caspers. <laughs> As in, this is, the, Jekyll is, is really, I, I think it's a great tool. Um, Obviously, I still think like it could be nice if there was a way to hand this off to say somebody to create content who isn't a developer, but that's that's a problem with every one of them. So I'm not going to dock anybody on that. All right. So next, we're going to look at Middleman. So Middleman is also Ruby based, and you also would do to sudo gem install Middleman. You can install. Uh, I I didn't try it, but um, Middleman does apparently work on Windows by default with the Ruby installer. So give it bonus points for that. Um, getting started uh, is a little bit different than, say, than Jekyll. So you need to just middleman I knit, and then your whatever product folder you want to create. Um, so obviously, to me, it's like, well, if you're going to do this, you want to have live re reload, like, right? So Jekyll has supported that out of the box. Middleman doesn't, so you have to actually go ahead and 
add the live reload to the gem file for the project. So you need to go add this line to your gem file. Then you need to activate live reload in the config file. Um, so you need to add that line, that activate live reload. And then you need to then go to the command line and run bundle install to install the live reload um, gem, gem file or whatever <laughs> bundle to install the live reload bundle. And then you would click, you know, start your server. So obviously that's a one time deal to have to do that, but it's still, it's not, there's no live reload built into middleman by default. Um, so the other thing is, is that the middleman default, so Jekyll by default will create you what's effectively a default set of blog files. So if you wanted to write a blog or some kind of content site based on, that's kind of blogish, I guess, um, you would just generate the default files. Middleman doesn't do that. Middleman creates you like just kind of a default site. If you wanted the blog template, then you would do this middleman and it, you know, with whatever your project name is, and then dash dash template equal blog. Um, one nice thing that Jekyll doesn't have by default is if I want to create, so, I mean, Jekyll has the requirements for how you date, you know, name things, and also has, needs to have particular front matter on there, um, but there's no, like, Jekyll generate me an ar a article, blank article. Uh, there are tools that'll do that, but, but middleman has that built in. So I just say middleman article and I give it a title and it's going to generate me that with the front matter that it, it needs and so on. For templating, it uses ERB templating. I'm not a Ruby guy, so I didn't know ERB, but that's, I guess, a standard Ruby library. Um, it also ships with support for things like Haml, SAS. Um, well, I kind of put SAS there twice by it. Um, and CoffeeScript. It's got, uh, you know, the posts are written in Markdown with YAML front matter for the most part, but it does support a JSON front matter, which is kind of a quirky little um, syntax, but it does support it if you, for whatever reason you prefer to write the front matter in JSON. Um, there are other options for, for content and, and templating that are available as plugins, but those are the defaults. I'm going to switch over and look at my middleman site to show you guys a little bit of difference. Oh, come on. I can't see this whatsoever. All right. Sorry, when I switch programs, it seems to kind of screw up the um, sizing here. All right, we're not going to do it that way. Just drag it. Oh, come on. All right, so that's, that looks big enough now. All right, so let's, I'm going to close these up. So you don't have to see all my mailing files. And no, I don't want to save you. So let's, we've got middleman site here. So you, so the, the one of the quirky things, so you have this config RB, and I can add, cause like I wanted to add the same variables and things that I added to the other one. Um, you do like this is where you have all I can actually add that separator it's pretty basic as well you can set like how you want to format the the file names and so on this this all comes when you generate the blog template so th this part up here where the blog dot summary and so on by default the middle middleman template does not include that blog stuff but if you do the middleman template equal that equal blog it'll generate this stuff for you and activate the blog as well um, that's where my live reload activate is. So one of the quirky things is like, you know, the, the front matter effectively, the global variables you want to set would be set in this config RB and you have to kind of do it using this um, kludgy little syntax here. So this is where like I'm setting the site title, the banner, and the description that I did in the YAML front matter um, on Jekyll. I do it using this set uh, colon description and then put the description in there and so on. So that's where that would be set. Slightly different than than um, Jekyll, how Jekyll does it. Uh, data, the, this is actually the exact same YAML file from the other one. So it works, that works just the same. Um, you just access it slightly differently. It structures it slightly differently as well. It has a source file. And so some of these are generated, but here's my, um, 
I converted most of these layout, the, all the layouts to ERB. Partials it, it's more or less the same. Um, it just has the slightly different syntax. So, you know, with this uh, bracket print um, percent equal, and then the partial, and so on. That's uh, that's how you do that. Everything is kind of is is more or less the same. You have the, you have the yield instead of the content, but other than that, I mean, it's really basically the same. Um, Here's the index.html so we can see how we loop through the data and stuff like that. Again, it's pretty pretty easy. The data is in, as under data.characters. So same as before it was site.data. Here's just data.characters. The syntax for doing loops and stuff is a little bit different, but other than that, it's pretty easy. Um, it also has, like, here's my first two articles. It does have, like, some basic things like I can limit to, to the, only the two articles as opposed to doing, you know, having to figure out a way to break the loop and stuff like that. Um, same, same as the other one, just different syntax. Um, hold on. And then I wanted to show one other thing here because the, the date time, it did actually have like helpers and stuff for date time and, and things like that. Hold on. Let me see if I can find here. There was a way to define um, custom functions in here, which I did have to do somewhere, and I'm blanking on exactly where. Post.erb. No, it's not that one. Mm, layouts. No, partials. Mm. No, I guess it wasn't here. Anyway. Um, as I said, it's it's pretty it's pretty simple. It's more or less the same as Jekyll, with some slight differences um, in terms of syntax for the, the layouts and stuff. Um, like we said, the the variables you can set global variables in config RB. You can set front matter in the YAML front matter on a per post basis. So we can set custom variables. Um, the data files can be YAML or JSON. So no CSV support. But um, you can do YAML and JSON. I mean, I think that's pretty much what you guys are going to want to do anyway, right? So overall, uh, I thought getting started was a little bit less simple. Obviously, you have to go through that convoluted process to get the live reload installed. Um, and actually, getting plugins and stuff installed is a little bit more convoluted than I thought than Jekyll was. Um, also, you had to understand, like, OK, well, I need to generate the um, blog template if I want to be able to do certain things. Otherwise, you know, um, and then you have these configurations in that config RB, like where you have to activate modules and things, which once you understand it, isn't that hard, but it's really not the easiest getting started process in the world. Um, template and content, I thought it was pretty, I thought it was pretty good. Um, ERB is, the only trouble I had with template and content, and I'm docking at a point, even though it should be under documentation, was that Middleman doesn't do anything to document really um, ERB, and there's the documentation I found kind of sparse for ERB. Like it's spread out. There's an official documentation, but it's not the easiest thing to read. It's you know if you want to learn how to get started, it's just not. It's it's more of like an API doc than it is like a how to get started with ERB and how to do simple things. There are some tutorials out there by separate people, but the documentation is kind of weak. I thought custom data just it's it's easy. Um, same as Jekyll, so I thought it was pretty good. Documentation was um, pretty good. It, it was missing in some parts, but I thought it was pretty good overall. Extensibility, there are a lot of middleman ex extensions as well. It's pretty extensible. Um, again, you have to know Ruby, but, but if you do know that, it is pretty extensible, and there are a lot out there. Um, and it does a little bit better um, with language support. Obviously, we talked about it. it comes out, of the, out of the box, it supports Haml, SAS, and other things that that say Jekyll didn't over. Um, so overall, I, I'd say I gave it I gave it four um, stars or Caspers or whatever. Um, mostly because I thought it was a little bit harder to get started. I do think it's a little bit it's not quite as intuitive overall as Jekyll, in my opinion. I found it a little bit convoluted at times. It almost felt like I just say it like you know this is the developer writing a tool for develop like who likes to feel like. The, if I make it slightly more difficult, then I'm smarter. You know, you know, you all know developers who write things a little 
Kind of, so that's, it little, feels a little bit needlessly difficult at times. Um, and that's where I dock at a point for. But otherwise, I still think it's a really good solution. Um, and, and obviously, one thing to consider is that it's not necessarily, I mean, you can use Jekyll for whatever. You don't have to use it for bugs. But this one out of the box is really designed to do, to do all kinds of different static sites, not necessarily just bugs and stuff like that. Right? All right, so lastly, we're going to look at Harp. So Harp um, is JavaScript based. It's actually, uh, you, you install it with NPM. So you just do uh, sudo npm install global harp. Um, obviously, if you're on Windows, you don't need the sudo. And it will work on Windows, because I mean, npm works on win pretty much Windows. So uh, create a new project, harp in it. And then you give it the project name folder. Um, there are different boilerplates out there. There's a handful of boilerplates that come predefined with harp, but I mean, you don't necessarily need to use a boilerplate like, like middleman because there's not like specific blog configuration files that need to be set and, and modules that need to be activated. So, but this is just like if you want to see the default code for running a blog, it'll generate that so that you can then work off of that for work building your blog or whatever. Um, so it uses, by default, it uses Jade. Um, and I, I say because it also supports EJS, SAS, LESS, CoffeeScript. Um, and so like Jade and EJS, would, you'll see the examples often given in both. Um, comparing it, in this case, we're using Jade because if you generate the default template, it will generate Jade. And so if you want to do EJS, you'll have to rewrite those in EJS. It's not generating you an EJS template by default. Posts can be, are obviously Markdown, um, GitHub flavor Markdown, but you can actually write posts in Jade if you're so inclined to write posts in Jade. Um, there's JSON metadata required, like basically to run the blog, I'll show you this, but it requires you to list out your posts with, with the metadata in a separate file, so it's, it's a little bit tedious in that sense. So you have to create this data.json in, in basically all these directories. Um, one thing it does that the others, I, did you know it didn't seem to do by default is like you can do you don't have to create like if you want to create data um, based on say a list of files like I want to show a whole bunch of pictures I can actually just say oh loop over give me every image in this directory in a loop and I can loop over that and generate stuff off of that right um, so in that case I wouldn't need a data.json to do it but it's just going to give me the files it's not going to give me what's in them or like, you know, it's not going to pull data out of them. It's just going to give me the files and I can say use that to make a list of images or something like that. And it does support custom variables. Let's take a look at what this one looks like so you can kind of get a sense here. All right. So so here's my harp site. It puts it in this public folder. So I have to create this data.json. So one of the quirky things about it is, so you have to have this basic data.json. This is my global data.json. Unless I put the characters here, I didn't put them in uh, characters YAML or characters JSON, because the custom data that you want global to the site, which in this case I wanted the characters to be accessible anywhere, has to be in this file, which I think is kind of a pain in the butt, honestly. And then one of the other things is that you don't necessarily know I found the first time I used this, I found it really hard to figure out how to access the data and where, like, you know, how to loop over. Like, it just wasn't intuitive. It was kind of a black box because there was not a lot of documentation telling me how to get at this data and how to, how to use it, um, at least from a global perspective. So uh, here is my layouts. Jade looks quite a bit different. So I can still do my partials and stuff like that. Um, I still have my yield, but it's just, it's Jade. Um, how many of you are familiar with Jade? A uh, handful of you. Okay, cool. Um, so looking at like my index.jade would be the, the one that loops through. So here's another quirky. There, there was nothing to do the excerpt by default. I couldn't like do excerpt, you know, um, this particular content and get my summary. So I could do it, but I had to create this. This is basically a JavaScript function, but I'm putting these dashes so it, you know, it doesn't compile it into the final file. It actually runs it. You know, I, I'm running it when I do the compile time. 
that doesn't show up in the file once it's fully compiled, but that's running when I, um, so I can call that function from within my content. So I do, I, you'll see like where I call the, the post and I, I, I call the function excerpt and I pass it the post information. Another one is like it didn't have a function to make the date pretty by default. So I had to create a function to make the date pretty. Um, I'll admit I, I didn't do a great job because it's repeated in a number of places, but I found it kind of, um, anyway, it was, it was just the easiest, quickest solution um, to getting that done. Uh, and what's another? So you can do your if and, and things like that as well. So, I mean, you can pretty much do all the stuff. It's just sometimes you're going to have to come up with a solution where there's no pre built, like pre-baked solution in, in uh, the templating. So let's go, oh, whoops, sorry. I don't want to go there. I want to go back to PowerPoint. Oh. And I wanted to show the data.json file because, let's see. So it does support custom variables. It does support the custom data. So I showed you the data.json file for the global. I wanted to show you this because this is quite a bit different. So in my posts here, so each post, if you notice, is just the markdown. There's no front matter on the post. And I have to have... Um, a data.json, so like when I add a post, I then have to go add a corresponding entry in this data.json file to tell it where to put it. Another interesting thing is it will spit you out the posts in the order that they are in the file. So like I couldn't say, I'd have to write something separate say to sort them by date, stuff like that. It's not by default going to send me by descending date order. It just gives me the order that it's in here, if that makes sense. So, Another big difference. There we go. So, giving an overview. Um, so, getting started is really easy because it's just npm install and you're good to go, right? So, that part was easy. It actually generates you the files pretty, pretty easily as well. I'm going to skip templating and content for now. Uh, and you'll see why. So custom data, it allows it. It just was kind of difficult to figure out how to access it. And it's a little bit kludgy having to put everything in a separate data.json file. Documentation was OK. It's obviously, as I said, it's missing a lot of stuff for custom data and things. It's gotten better, but it's not a lot better. It's not extensible as far as I know. I couldn't find anything telling me it's extensible. Um, other than you can write custom um, like templates. So, so they have a list of ones they've created, but you can write your own like custom templates that generate the base files for you. Other than that, it's not really extensible. Um, the language support out of the box, it has supported a bunch of stuff, so it's pretty good. I gave template and content. I didn't even give it a Casper. I gave it a Slimer because, you know, because, yeah. And because, and the overall of three, because my feelings about Jade, this is how I feel about Jade. I don't know if any of you love it. I absolutely hate it. I think it's painful and it's, it's uh, like I end up doing, I have to write the same stuff I do in HTML. I just have to use a different syntax. The only thing I'm missing is the brackets and the closing tags, which my editor does for me anyway. So like I don't get what Jade does for me at all. And I find it tedious to write. Um, so, trying to be fair because I hated Jade so much and I think I, it made me hate Harp that I said, okay, well, let me go back. My friend who, who likes Harp is like, no, 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 man. The first thing I do is I, I just say, screw Jade, we're going with EJS. So I'm like, okay, let's go ahead and do it with EJS. So I did go ahead and do this. So the other ratings would be the same. Let me just show you really quickly. I know we're running long here, but um, I'm almost done. So I'm going to show you, here's this harp site. I did the harp site with EJS um, just to kind of give you a sense of what the EJS templates look like. Uh, here's my index. So it's going to look a lot like ERB, just slightly different syntax. I still had to do these functions for getting, you know, for pretty, you know, prettifying the date and adding the excerpt and stuff. So that's still required. 
Um, but I, you know, I, I had to use, the only thing different in terms of this was it doesn't have the equal sign and stuff like that. And I had to add the curly braces for the functions and things like that. But other than that, it looks like E or B, right? So it's not that different. Um, so how does using EJS change my feelings about harp? Well, okay, I'll give the templating a two because I thought it was like, I, di I didn't particularly like EJS that much either. I thought it was really poorly documented for the, for the most part. Um, you know, you guys may have different feelings about this, but that was, that was my own feeling. I, so, so it wasn't like, you know, our, like torture as writing Jade was, but it was, you know, it was just painful. So I left, I basically kind of said, well, it didn't really change my overall feelings because everything else pretty much stayed the same and it wasn't significantly better. So that's my feelings on Harp. Um, so those are the three I'm going to, I'm going to compare. Those are my feelings on them. Feel free to go out and try them. Obviously, if you're going to deploy them, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really easy. They're, they're, in the end, I'm not going to cover how you do it, but in the end, they all have a build process that spits you out um, HTML. Uh, one of the things to consider for Harp is that it actually runs, you can actually run the server. There's a Harp server that you can just throw on your, on your server and, and run them. So you could actually run, um, one of the neat things about it is say you want to be able to just never actually compile them. You could run them and it serves up uh, Jade and um, EJS and, and CoffeeScript and SAS and so on without ever needing to compile. So you do have that option with, with that. Um, GitHub pages obviously with Jekyll um, and you can use any of the cloud storage um, solutions like Google's and Microsoft's and so on. Um, some of these actually, and I mention them because some of them actually have hooks um, in their, they have a whole deployment process where they have a hook into just flat out deploying to one of these very easily. Um, so that's an option. Harp has its own Harp platform, which is not free, but it uses um, Google Drive or no, no, it doesn't use Google Drive. It uses Dropbox and you can actually dump posts in a Dropbox folder and your Harp bug will automatically add that in and, and spit it out and serve up the new post. So it's an option. I, I haven't tested it out, but that's, you know, it, it's a, one of the differentiators, say, for Harp. Um, so this is the, uh, and if you want to pull the slides, it's at like, uh, I have an article, as I mentioned, that covers a lot of this, but in a slightly different format. Um, I did talk about Jekyll, Harp, and Roots, um, and that's on, developer.telerik.com, so it's called Comparing Static Site, site Engines. Um, it's written by me, obviously. That's the site I run for, for Telerik. Uh, the slides and sample are on GitHub um, under my slash remote synth. And I don't have a lot of projects up there, so you, you'll be able to find it. It's just called Static Site Samples. Um, there are a couple sites that list a ton of these engines. Obviously, there's more than the three that I covered. It's just not possible to cover a lot more in this time frame. So um, there's staticsitegenerators.net, which is the one that lists all 384 of them, if you're curious and have a lot of free time. Um, and there's also staticgen.com, which lists a ton of them, gives a little bit more detailed information in terms of what language they're written in, what templates, like what templating language they support, and um, so on. So uh, with that being said, this is my uh, contact info. You can find me on Twitter at Remote Synth. Uh, feel free to email me at uh, brian.rinaldi at Telerik. Um, also, Telerik's running a conference, in case you're curious, uh, called Telerik Next in, in Boston in May. And I, I promise you that by then, at least a quarter of the snow will have melted. <laughs> um, possibly. I, well, okay. um, so May's usually pretty nice in Boston. It's a great place to be. And this, the hotel's like right on the water with a view of the whole downtown and everything. Should be a lot of fun. Um, so come out there if you're interested. Um, I know that we're going to take questions later, so I won't ask questions. But we'll take that later. So, All right. Um, you had a couple lightning talks, right? Okay. Did you want to do questions after, right? Yep. Okay. Cool. So, Thanks. Well, thank you.